This podcast was produced using artificial intelligence and refined by human editors. Bonjour, travelers, and welcome aboard another adventure with Travel with Lara and Luca. As always, I'm Luca. And I'm Lara. We're your dedicated and, dare I say, charming guides on this audio journey through some of the most interesting and exciting places around the globe. Today, we're taking you with us on a virtual voyage to the sparkling shores of the French Riviera, or as the French call it, the Côte d'Azur. Ah, the Côte d'Azur, a name that conjures up images of azure waters, sun-soaked promenades, and glamour that can only be rivaled by the golden age of Hollywood. Speaking of which, did you know, Lara, that many silver screen stars have graced these shores, making the French Riviera synonymous with the glitzy and the glamorous? Oh, absolutely, Luca. I sometimes wonder if the stars in the sky feel a tinge of jealousy toward the French Riviera for stealing their shine. With icons like Grace Kelly becoming literal royalty here, it's no wonder the Riviera is a beacon for those seeking a touch of elegance and allure. Right you are. The fascinating thing is, while everyone knows about the yacht-adorned marinas and film festivals, our little jaunt today promises to unveil the hidden nooks, captivating history, and some rather peculiar tales that this Mediterranean paradise has to offer. Peculiar tales, indeed. We've got stories that involve mysterious iron-masked men and citrus sculptures that sound like they've come straight out of a whimsical fairy tale. But before we peel back the layers of these anecdotes, see what I did there? Very punny, Lara. Citrus peel. But before Lara gets us lost in a grove of tangy puns, let's set the scene properly. The French Riviera stretches along the southeastern coast of France and unfurls like a glamorous red carpet from the charming town of Saint-Tropez all the way to the Italian border. It's a tapestry woven with threads of opulent marinas, terracotta-roofed villages, and hidden coves that are accessible only by those in the know, or those who religiously listen to our podcast, of course. And let's not forget about the city of Nice, the unofficial capital of the Riviera, with its renowned Promenade des Anglais, where you can stroll along with the Mediterranean breeze in your hair as street performers add a soundtrack to the already vivid setting. Now, I remember my first time walking down that promenade, Luca. The sea was just the perfect shade of blue. You know, they say that the French Riviera has its own unique blue, one that captures the essence of the Mediterranean Sea in the sky at once. Artists have tried to translate it to canvas for centuries. There's just something about it that feels like coming home to a place you've never been before. Poetic as ever, Lara, and rightfully so. And that's before we mention some of the small towns, which in my humble opinion, are the jewels of the Côte d'Azur. Places like Ez, nestled high above the sea, with botanical gardens that make you feel like you've climbed to some sort of floral Olympus. Or the sleepy, yet unbelievably picturesque Villefranche-sur-Mer where the colorful buildings seem to tumble down towards the shore like a cascade of Lego bricks left out by some giant careless child. Don't give the giants ideas, Lara. Next thing we know, we'll have to do an episode on travel with Lara and Mail, dealing with mythical creatures and how to avoid their toys. <laughs> a scintillating topic for another time. But while the sights are indeed a feast for the eyes, let's not leave our taste buds yearning, shall we? The cuisine here is nothing short of a masterpiece. From the freshest seafood to that simple, yet incredibly satisfying Salade Niçoise. Ah, and you can't forget about Saka, the region's answer to street food fare, a chickpea pancake that's become somewhat of a personal challenge for me at home. Not quite as easy as they make it look. I've seen Luca's attempts and, well, let's say he's better at eating them than making them. But honestly, it's difficult to get it wrong with food here even when you're not a culinary expert like ourselves. Bound by mountain and sea, this region's got a bounty that caters to all palates. Precisely. Whether you're people watching from a charming cafe while sipping on some chilled rosé, or you're tucked away in a dimly lit restaurant in the old town, digging into a hearty bouillabaisse, the flavors of the Riviera can't help but dance on your tongue. Speaking of bouillabaisse, if you're in Cannes, there's this quaint little spot, Luca, what was the name of that place again? With those to die for seafood platters and a view right out of a painting? Ah, you're thinking of La Mirabelle. 
Their terrace overlooks the yachts and the setting sun, casting golden hues over the marina. Trust me, folks, it's a place where the seafood is as fresh as the jokes I tell. Which is saying something. But beyond the alluring culinary scene, it's the culture and artistic heritage that really sets the Riviera apart. Museums here aren't just buildings, they're gateways into the minds and hearts of some of the world's most revered artists. Matisse, Picasso, Chagall, they all found inspiration in the light and the life of the French Riviera. You know, I remember getting lost in the Matisse Museum up in Simiez, and I mean that both figuratively and literally. I was so engrossed in his use of color that I took a wrong turn and ended up in a utility closet. Closest I've ever come to becoming part of a Matisse masterpiece myself. <laughs> oh, Luca, always finding yourself in the most unexpected places. And it's not only visual arts that have found a haven here, but the olfactory arts too. The perfume industry in Grasse continues to bottle the essence of this region in a way that's distinctly Provençal makes you wonder if we could capture the essence of our podcast in a perfume. What would that smell like, Lara? Hmm. Hints of humor, a splash of spontaneity, and a bass note of wanderlust, perhaps? I'd wear that any day. And let's not forget about our weird and wonderful tales segment later. We'll talk about the island of Saint Marguerite, just a stone's throw away from Cannes, and its legendary Man in the Iron Mask. Yes, and the vibrant lemon festival in Menton with fruit sculptures that make you wonder if you've wandered into some whimsical alternate reality. Essentially, the Riviera has a bit of everything. History, mystery, beauty, and even a touch of the bizarre. And who better to explore the bizarre than the two of us? But as we revel in the unusual, we mustn't overlook the historical anchors of the region. Iconic spots like the mighty Prince's Palace in Monaco which makes me feel like renouncing my commoner status every time I see it. I'll never forget Luke Luca waving to the crowd outside the palace like he's the long-lost royal. I think Prince Albert may still be wondering who that enthusiastic chap is. One does one's best to fit in, Lara. And then there's Fort Carré in Antibes, a fortress so perfectly placed, someone must have used a cheat code in a game of civilization. A cheat code, indeed. It is a place seemingly designed by both history and artists alike. Everywhere you look, there's a sense of timeless elegance, combined perfectly with vibrant, modern energy. As we daydream about historic forts and princely waves, let's not forget the brass tacks of traveling here. Coming up in our travel tip segment, we'll tell our audience about taking the coastal train for breathtaking views, or why renting a vintage car might just be the Riviera experience they're looking for. Those winding cliffside roads were made for dramatic drives, though maybe not for those who fear heights or the occasional misplaced giant's Lego brick. Anyway, we'll even dip into tips on avoiding tourist traps and getting the most out of your visit without falling into the classic tourist faux pas. And of course, we'll share our take on the best times to visit. Though let me tell you folks, summer sunburns is a term I know all too intimately. Never underestimate the Mediterranean sun. We'll make sure to include some sunblock hacks with our travel tips then. And last but not least, side excursions and day trips. Ever thought about snorkeling around the Larens Islands or crossing the Italian border for some market bargaining? We've got you covered there as well. Oh, those stories are gems waiting to be discovered. And just like that, it's time to really dive into the spirit of the French Riviera. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, take a moment to imagine the salty air, the murmur of distant waves, and let Travel with Lara and Luca take you away. Sit back or keep walking, jogging, cooking, whatever floats your boat, and let us guide you through the magic of the French Riviera. And who knows, by the end of our time together, you might just be planning your next vacation or at least dreaming about it. Au revoir for now, dear listeners. We have to push off from shore but don't go anywhere. The best is yet to come, right here on Travel with Lara and Luca. Stay tuned. Welcome back, fellow adventurers. Let's delve into the first segment of our podcast, the lure of the Azure Coast. You know, the French Riviera isn't just a geographical marvel. It's an icon, a lifestyle, a piece of the collective dreamscape that somehow exists in reality. That's beautifully put, Luca. 
If the Riviera were a movie, it would be an epic romance, a thrilling adventure, and a comedy rolled into one. Which isn't far off given its long-standing relationship with the film industry. Each May, the world turns its eyes to Cannes for the film festival. But the allure of the Côte d'Azur isn't seasonal, it's year-round. And while movie stars float in on waves of camera flashes, the real star remains the Azure Sea itself. It's not just blue, it's a spectrum. From turquoise to midnight blue, there's a hue for every mood and time of day. The Riviera is a kaleidoscope of colors. The blue of the sea against the ochre of the buildings and the myriad greens from palms and pines. The play of light here has a unique quality, one that's inspired artists and attracted the wealthy and famous for generations. Wealthy, indeed. Let's not forget the yachts, those floating palaces that pepper the coast from Saint-Tropez to Monaco. I once overheard a yacht owner call his vessel a modest little thing. It had a helipad, Lara. A helipad. <sighs> modest, indeed. And while the opulence is a sight to behold, it's the stories of those who visit and those who call the Riviera home that truly capture the imagination. Take, for instance, the legendary Brigitte Bardot and her love affair with Saint-Tropez, the town, not the saint, to be clear. Her presence in the 50s transformed a sleepy fishing village into a global symbol for chic resort living. Spots like Club 55, which started as a humble beach shack, are now synonymous with the jet-set lifestyle. To think all it takes is one person to flip the script of history and turn a hidden gem into a sparkling diamond. Script flipping is a Riviera specialty, isn't it? Every cobbled street and narrow alleyway has witnessed a hundred stories, like Princess Grace's fairy tale. Yes, we've touched on her before, but who wouldn't? A Hollywood star turned real-life princess marrying Prince Rainier III of Monaco, turning the principality into the very personification of a fairy tale. Very true. And while the Côte d'Azur may seem like it's reserved for the rich and famous, the truth is it has a side that's accessible to all. Did you know that you can step into the Casino de Monte Carlo for a look around without gambling away your inheritance? Yes, and the people watching there is second to none. The blend of tourists in flip-flops alongside high rollers in tuxedos is a testament to the Riviera's dual identity. It's as democratic as it is exclusive. Speaking of democracy, let's not forget the Riviera's role as a refuge during times of turmoil. It's been a crossroads for exiles and artists, like Russian nobility escaping the revolution, and writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald, finding solace and inspiration along the Gulf of Saint-Tropez. That's another epic tale, the lost generation of writers and artists in the 20s and 30s seeking sanctuary and the joy de vivre that the Riviera offered in spades. Hemingway, Joyce, and Picasso, just to name drop a few, lived and loved here. And what about the Belle Époque? that beautiful era at the turn of the 20th century when the Riviera blossomed into a winter playground for royalty and aristocrats. They built grand villas and gardens, leaving a legacy of architectural treasures that we can still enjoy today. Absolutely, it was the Belle Époque that laid the foundations for the Riviera's mythos. Would you believe that what we now consider the peak of seaside chic was originally a health resort for the ailing British upper class? They came to escape the dreary winters and take in the air. I guess even back then, the Riviera had the ultimate wellness package. Our whimsical journey back in time wouldn't be complete without mentioning Nice, the queen of the Riviera. It was once part of Italy, well, technically the kingdom of Sardinia, until 1860. That's why so much of the city, from the architecture to the cuisine, has an Italian flair. It's a cultural mashup that created something uniquely niçoise. Old Town Nice, with its Italianate facades and bustling markets, feels like a Baroque symphony played on a French horn. The soca, the ratatouille, the pisaladier, each is a note in the city's culinary symphony. And for our listeners who, like Lara, love a quirky fact, did you know that Nice's pebbly beaches are a source of contention for sand lovers? They say once you learn to appreciate the smooth stones, you achieve true Riviera Nirvana. Oh yes, the pebble versus sand debate is a local pastime, but no matter which side you're on, the shimmering waters of the Baie des Anges are hard to resist. Just ask anyone who has watched the sunset here. It's like falling in love for the first time, every time. That might be the most romantic description of a sunset I've ever heard, Lara. But as the sun dips below the horizon, 
It's almost time for us to dip into the next segment where we'll talk about those must-see places and hidden gems we promised. From the manicured lawns of the Cap d'Antibes to the rocky inlets called Calanque, there's a picture-perfect spot waiting to be discovered. So, dear listeners, hold tight, or more aptly, let go completely. We're jumping from epic history to the beauty of the now, from the sweeping views high above the sea to the cool corners of local favorites. Stay tuned for more from the captivating Côte d'Azur coming right after the break. A tout à l'heure, as the French would say. We'll be back in a moment. And we're back. You're listening to Travel with Lara and Luca, cruising through the azure waves of the Côte d'Azur. In this segment, we're spotlighting those must-see places, and because we adore the road less traveled, some hidden gems of the French Riviera. Let's start with an icon, the kind of place that makes you believe in the magic of postcards, Nice. This city is like the Riviera's beating heart, with the Promenade des Anglais as its main artery, flanked by the Bay des Anges on one side and a parade of Belle Epoque architecture on the other. Stepping into Nice is like stepping onto the set of a period drama where the costumes are designer sunglasses and linen suits, and every character you meet is the star of their own Riviera story. One of my favorite characters is the flower market at Corsalea. You think you've seen colors? Wait till you see the explosions of pinks, purples, and every imaginable hue spilling over the market stalls. It's a feast for the senses. The scent of mimosa is something else. And bees. Remember that time you tried to befriend a bee because you thought it was liking your lavender cologne? I can't help it if the bees appreciate my taste in fragrances. Anyway, moving on from the buzzing locals, let's talk about Ez. This medieval village perched on a hill is a hidden gem that offers some of the most dramatic views of the Riviera. Ease is a stairway to heaven, quite literally. Each step takes you higher into the clouds and with great ascent comes great panoramic rewards. Plus the exotic botanical garden at the top is like wandering into Eden. If Eden had succulents and sculptures, that is. The village has this quiet storybook charm with narrow lanes and stone houses. But word to the wise, wear comfortable shoes. The cobblestones are unforgiving to heels, or in my case, fresh loafers. You might say my fashion sense was at odds with Ez's historic practicality. Heels and cobblestones, the original enemies. Less of a battle and more a balancing act in A's, I'd say. Another small town that's a must-see piece of this mosaic is Villefranche-sur-Mer, a quintessential fishing village nestled in a quiet bay. The colors there, can we talk about that for a second? It's as if someone had a giant watercolor palette and decided to paint every building a different shade, from terracotta reds to sunny yellows, even eggshell blues. It's a whole rainbow. Yes, and between the houses, you get these slivers of sea that remind you you're tucked into a living postcard. And there's the Chapel of Saint-Pierre with Jean Cocteau's murals, a jewel box of art hidden within a simple fisherman's chapel. Cocteau himself said he wanted the chapel to smell of the sea, incense, and fish, suggesting a blend of the divine with the daily grind of fishermen. I think he nailed it. If you're someone who enjoys a more hands-on approach to the Riviera, then perhaps it's worth leaving the coast behind. There are vineyards inland, where the nectar of the gods is just waiting to be sipped. Luca, that vineyard we just visited, Chateau de Belle, what was that red we tried? Ah, yes, the Baron G, bold yet delicate like a well-choreographed dance. If you're a wine enthusiast, these inland treks are where you trade the blue of the sea for the green of the grapes, and the result is just divine. So divine, in fact, that the monks started it. Winemaking in this part of the Riviera dates back to the days when monks tended vines in their ecclesiastical domains. A little heavenly inspiration in each bottle, perhaps? Now if we're talking heaven, there's a certain something about grass that feels ethereal. It might have something to do with the fact that it's the perfume capital of the world. The flower fields there are the secret behind some of the most famous fragrances known to humankind. Yet grass itself is unassuming, a place perfumed by its heritage where roses and jasmine bloom. Its charm is not just in its scents, but also in the old world winding streets that promise a tranquil escape. I get a whiff of lavender, and I'm instantly transported back to grass. 
There's a true art to the craft of perfume making, and Gras embodies that artistry. They've even got a perfume museum, Musée International de la Parfumerie, to explore that passion, which is almost as intoxicating as the perfume itself. Everything about the Riviera seems to engage the senses. Even in the less explored corners like the Valrama Botanical Garden in Menton, you can feel the love and care poured into the cultivation of exotic plants from around the world. Menton, with its annual lemon festival, is the delightfully tangy twist in the Riviera's tale. Imagine sculptures, yes sculptures, made of lemons and oranges. It's audacious, a bit odd, but entirely wonderful. The Riviera guarantees you stories to take home, to savor like a good wine or a citrusy feast for your eyes. It opens its arms and offers up its secrets to those with an explorer's heart. Whether you're bathing in the splendor of iconic locales or discovering the solace of hidden escapes, there's a corner just for you, waiting to be claimed. And with that, let's set our compass towards our next segment, where a different sensory treat awaits. We'll dive into the Riviera's cuisine, a feast that combines sea, garden, and bakery delights into an art form unto itself. So don't go changing that dial or whatever it is you do with a podcast. We're about to indulge in the delicacies of the Côte d'Azur. Stay tuned as, tra as Travel with Lara and Luca serves you the next course in this extravagant French feast. Bon appétit in advance. And we're back, ready to dive straight into the heart, or should I say the stomach of the French Riviera. Welcome to segment three, where we talk about indulging in French cuisine. Luca, care to kick us off with some mouth-watering descriptions of Riviera fare? You know it, Lara. All right, listeners, imagine this. You're sitting at a breezy seaside terrace. The air is tinged with salt, and sitting in front of you is a dish that captures the essence of the Mediterranean, a salade niçoise. As in Nice, which we've already gushed over. This salad, folks, is more than just a dish. It's a proclamation of the region's bounty. Tuna, fresh or canned, hard-boiled eggs, green beans, ripe tomatoes, a scattering of olives, maybe some baby potatoes, all brought together by a drizzle of olive oil and perhaps a splash of vinegar. And it's more than just a salad. It's a statement piece about simple ingredients coming together in a perfect symphony. Each bite takes you on a little tour of Nice's markets, don't you think, Lara? Exactly. Speaking of markets, every time I walk through Corsalea, Nice's famous flower and food market, I fall in love all over again. Stalls burst with colors and aromas, the earthiness of fresh herbs, the sharp tang of aged cheese, and the zestiness of just-picked citrus. It's an assault on the senses, in the best way possible. It's where the ocean meets the soil, where fishermen's catch lies side by side with farmers' crops. But you've raised a good point there with citrus, Lara. We should talk about one of my favorite culinary oddities, the lemon of menton. Ah, yes. These aren't your average lemons, listeners. They're revered for their sweetness, and if local lore is to be believed, possess the ability to cure what ails you. Whether it's in a tart, a salad, or zested over fresh fish, the lemon of menton is a taste unlike any other. They're like little golden suns that light up a dish, and they feature prominently in the annual Lemon Festival in Menton, which, by the by, is a sight to behold. Picture huge sculptures made entirely of lemons and oranges. It's like stepping into a citrus wonderland. But let's shift gears from the tangy to something more. Russell? Ah, Sokka. You may remember Luca mentioned this earlier. Sokka is this region's answer to, well, do tacos have an answer? Anyway, it's a chickpea pancake, crispy edged, savory, and absolutely addictive. Ah, the trials and tribulations of my Sokka making saga. Lara has witnessed my many attempts, and they usually, how shall I say, reflect my creative nature. Let's just say, Luca's Sokka wouldn't win any beauty contests, but his efforts are commendable. The food here really inspires you to try your hand at it, doesn't it? It's honest food. There's a purity to the cuisine that seems to say, here are our ingredients, here's our tradition, do with it what you will. Slow roasted lamb with herb de Provence, ratatouille that's stewed for hours, or a crusty baguette with just a touch of cheese. It's all fair game in the Riviera. Oh, speaking of bread, who can forget the fougasse? This leaf-shaped or lattice-shaped bread is similar to focaccia and it sometimes comes filled or topped with olives, cheese, anchovies, or all of the above. 
it's the perfect accompaniment to people watching in the Palais des Pop in Avignon, well, if we stray a little off the Riviera track. We've all been that mesmerized tourist munching on a crumbly, delicious piece of bread, almost missing the beauty in front of us. Now, for something that's perhaps a bit controversial, bouillabaisse. Originating from Marseille, further west along the coast, this hearty fish stew is a bone of contention, isn't it? Indeed, Luca. Though native to Marseille, bouillabaisse has been embraced by the Riviera with open arms. However, purists argue over what goes into an authentic bouillabaisse. Should the fish be firm or tender? Should the rui, the accompanying spicy mayonnaise, pack a punch or be more subdued? I recall one particular seaside cafe. The octogenarian owner insisted his grandmother's recipe was the only true bouillabaisse. It was a complex ritual of specific fish and precise timing, like a dance of flavors coming together on a stovetop stage. Octogenarian cafe owners tell the best stories, but there's something about the Mediterranean's briny depth that gives the seafood here an edge. And it's not just about high-end dining. Some of the best meals I've had were in unassuming beachside restaurants, their plastic chairs sinking into the sand, serving just-caught seafood grilled to perfection. That perfectly charred, crispy skin on the outside, the tender, melt-in-your-mouth fish on the inside, it's the sort of unpretentious culinary experience that sticks with you. It's the essence of Riviera dining, the unadulterated pleasure of simplicity. The Côte d'Azur has this remarkable way of making you feel like every meal is a special occasion, doesn't it? Which brings me to the sweetest part of our culinary narrative, the desserts. Ah, the sweets, quite literally, the cherry on top. Ever try to tart tropezienne, Lara? Oh, a piece of heaven right there, Luca. This dessert precisely reflects the Côte d'Azur. It's beautiful, indulgent, and yet it has a lightness to it that's unmistakable. It's a brioche bun, sliced in half and filled with a light custard cream, dusted with sugar, simple and yet sublime. Much like the best parts of travel, wouldn't you say? It's in the meals we share and the conversations we have over a cafe creme that we truly experience a place. And speaking of sharing, I think it's time we shared some time with our next segment on culture and art. Because if there's anything as integral to the French Riviera as its food, it's its artistic heritage. True that, Luca. So dear listeners, brush off the breadcrumbs, take one last sip of rosé, and join us as we meander through the galleries and cobblestone streets lined with canvases and history. Don't go anywhere. Travel with Lara and Luca will return after this short musical stroll through the old town. Hello again, beautiful listeners. Welcome back to Travel with Lara and Luca, We've savored the tastes, and now it's time to feast on the sights and sounds of the Riviera's rich cultural tapestry. Right, Luca? Absolutely, Lara. If the Riviera were a painting, it would be an ensemble piece with each artist contributing a dash of individual genius. So let's imbue our palettes with some artistic heritage, shall we? Let's. Beginning with Nice again, because it seems all roads lead to and from Nice on the Riviera. It's not just a city. It's a canvas that has inspired artists for centuries. The Musée Matisse is a perfect example, nestled up on the hill of Simiez among olive groves that are as old as time, or at least as old as those Roman ruins nearby. Can you imagine Matisse staring out at the same blue waters we adore, feeling that same sunlight on his face? His works there are explosions of color, each piece a window into the artist's love affair with the region. That museum alone tells a story of transformation. From a man wrestling with the limits of his physical body, channeling his energy into these vibrant creations. Now remember, the Renoir Museum is just a stone's throw away, another titan of Impressionism who found solace and inspiration in the Côte d'Azur. Indeed, and let's not forget Picasso's legacy around here. The man spent a hot minute in almost every part of Southern France. The Chateau Grimaldi in Antibes, for example, became his studio for a time. Today, it's a museum that holds some of his most jubilant works. And speaking of jubilant, the Fauvists, with their wild colors and untamed brushwork, found a haven here too. André Duran and Henri Manguin joined the lineup up of artists bewitched by the Riviera. The light here doesn't just illuminate, it transforms. The same could be said about Marc Chagall, whose museum in Nice is a porthole to his poetic soul. 
the biblical message collection, those large dreamlike canvases that meld story with color, they're honestly spiritual in a deeply human way. A moment in the Chagall Museum can feel like a lifetime, each painting urging you to linger longer. And just when you think you know what the Riviera is about, sun, sea, and glamour, you stumble upon the perfume capital of the world, grass. But Luca, this town wafts out more than just fancy fragrances. Oh, it does. Grass might be bottled enchantment, but it's also the backdrop for dramatic moments in history. From Napoleon's march to Italian tradesmen and royalty escaping the summer heat, grass's allure goes beyond the scents. It's not just the perfume, though that's certainly enthralling. The Musée International de la Parfumerie there is a dive into a history as rich as the scents themselves. But grass, with its lavender fields and rose gardens, is like walking into a living piece of art. Living art, that's a great way to describe it. Did you know that Fragonard, one of the historic perfumeries, offers workshops where visitors can create their personalized fragrance? It's art that follows you, a souvenir you craft with your own senses. I did, Luca. And speaking of crafting and workshops, we should talk about the artisanal culture here. The glass blowing in Biot, the pottery in Valloris, and not to mention all the little artisan workshops tucked away in the narrow streets of Vionis. The Riviera's art scene isn't confined to the past, it's very much alive. From the Galerie d'Art in Saint Paul de Vence to the avant garde exhibitions at the Fondation Mite, it's a tapestry of old world charm woven with threads of modern rebellion and innovation. The Fondation Mite deserves a moment here. It's a monument to contemporary creativity, with works by Miro, Braque, Calder. It's a bold statement in the middle of idyllic Provence, and it absolutely works. The sculptures seemingly grow from the earth itself, intertwining nature with artifice. You know, for all the art indoors, there's something about the Riviera that makes the outdoors just as artistic. Maybe it's the pristine gardens, like those of the Villa Frusi de Rothschild, with each garden representing a different part of the world. Ah, yes, the Villa Efrusi, one woman's grand vision brought to life. It's quite literally a walk through different cultures and epochs, with the added bonus of stunning views over the Mediterranean. Every corner you turn on the Riviera, you're met with history, art, and the unmistakable imprint of culture. But cultures also echo through the music here. We haven't even touched on the jazz festivals. We must. The Nice Jazz Festival, Jazz A Juan and Juan Les Pins, there's a rhythm here that goes beyond the lapping of the waves. It's in the music, in every art form that occupies this sun-kissed stretch of land. The Riviera doesn't just have a beat, it has a melody. A melody that we can all dance to. And as the sun sets on our segment on culture, we hope the dance continues in your hearts. Let's carry this rhythm over to our next part, where we'll explore some of the remarkably weird and wonderful tales that this region has to offer. Whispers of the old, murmurs of the strange, and the stories of the Riviera that make you smile, raise an eyebrow, or both. Don't wander too far. Luca and I will be spinning these tales in just a moment. And welcome back, fellow travelers. Now, every place has its secrets and stories, but the French Riviera, well, it's a treasure trove of the weird and the wonderful. Right, Lara? Couldn't agree more, Luca. There are tales here that stretch the bounds of reality, stories that seem born from the depths of an imaginative mind. Yet here on the Riviera, fact can be as intriguing as fiction. Let's start with one that's straight out of a Dumas novel, The Man in the Iron Mask. Ah, the mysterious prisoner held in the island fortress of Saint Marguerite, just off the coast of Cannes. This man, whose identity was kept secret by an iron mask, has inspired rumors and legends for centuries. Some say he was the twin brother of Louis XIV. Others believe he was a high-ranking noble who threatened the crown. I love how this tidbit of history has morphed into such a drama-filled story that we're still guessing the truth behind it today. I mean, the island itself is beautiful with its eucalyptus and pine forests, but knowing you're walking the same grounds as one of history's longest standing mysteries? That's spine-tingling stuff. Speaking of spine tingling, here's an eerie but true story for you. On the tranquil island of Porcaral, there's a cemetery where all the crosses are made of the wood of shipwrecks. 
It's a silent reminder of the mariners who met their fate in the treacherous waters around the Golden Isles. There's poetry in that, isn't there? Even in memoriam, the Riviera combines beauty with its tales. For something a little less grim and quite a bit zestier, let's pivot to something odd but delightful. Ready, Luca? Born ready. Menton's annual lemon festival, or Fête du Citron, is absolutely bonkers, in a citrusy, zestful way, of course. Imagine this, giant sculptures and floats, all crafted from lemons and oranges. It's like wandering into a land where citrus is king and vitamin C is the coin of the realm. Absolutely otherworldly. Who knew fruit could be so avant-garde? But the Riviera's weave of the Oz not stop at lemon structures. There are superstitions and fears here that are as peculiar as they come. Are you familiar with the story of the witch of Rue de Suits, Luca? Tell me more, Lara. I'm on the edge of my seat. So back in the 19th century, there was a road in Vents where a sudden fever afflicted anyone that passed. People were convinced a witch was to blame. The Rue de Suets became infamous, avoided by all. And was there a witch? Well, no. Turns out the so-called witch was simply an old woman who kept to herself. As for the fever, it was likely what we now know as mosquito-borne disease. But don't let the truth get in the way of a good witch story. Now, this one is less supernatural, but no less strange. In a small town called Gorbio, there's an annual festival called Fête du Saint-Louis. One of the highlights, a frog jumping contest. Yes, you heard that right, frogs competing in athletics. You can't make this stuff up. Ribbiting stuff, Luca. It's these quirky traditions that add such a fascinating layer to the area's allure. I mean, frogs aside, the Riviera has stories that seem like they're pulled from a motivational poster like the tale of the brave men of Eze. Heroes or daredevils? Maybe a bit of both. During World War II, a group from Eze scaled down the cliffs to the sea to meet up with allies, guiding them up the perilous path to the village. They did this repeatedly, never once being caught by the enemy. Fearlessness in the face of danger. There's bravery, and then there's Eze brave. As with everything here on the French Riviera, the extraordinary seems part and parcel of the everyday. It's a place that keeps you guessing, constantly surprising you with its capacity for the curious and the captivating. The Riviera's stories unfold like hidden pages in a spellbinding novel, with each town contributing its own chapter. The history, the people, their traditions and fears, it all combines to create a vibrant narrative tapestry. And this tapestry is still being woven right in front of our eyes. Who knows what other strange tales and delightful curiosities are being birthed in this magical stretch of coastline as we speak. It's these stories, both grand and offbeat, that make the French Riviera a treasure chest of tales. As we close this chapter of weird and wonderful, we open another on the historical landmarks and architecture that have stood as silent witnesses to these tales and others yet to be told. That's right. Stay with us, for after a short musical interlude, we will guide you through the grand palaces, ancient fortresses, and architectural marvels that tell the silent stories of the French Riviera. We'll return shortly on Travel with Lara and Luca. Welcome back, dear listeners, to our own historical epic, written not on pages, but in stone and marble along the Côte d'Azur. This segment is a reverence to the historical landmarks and architecture of the French Riviera. Lara, where do we start on this grand tour? Well, Luca, how about we ascend to the heights of royalty with the Prince's Palace of Monaco? Poised on Le Rocher, this 12th century fortress turned palace offers more than just opulent architecture. It's the living narrative of a proud Grimaldi tradition, as compelling as any page turning blockbuster. A blockbuster indeed, but let's not forget, this palace is still a home. The Grimaldi family has resided there for centuries, ruling over the second smallest country in the world with panache. The daily changing of the guards, oh, there's a precision there, a dance of regality and respect. And the view from the palace? Simply regal. You gaze out over Monaco's yacht-filled harbor, think back on Princess Grace's fairy tale wedding, and it's easy to imagine yourself into a story of nobles and knights. Speaking of stories, I've spent many an hour daydreaming about courtesies and conspiracies concocted in the palace's secretive chambers. I wonder if the palace walls could talk, what tales of whispered alliances and covert romances they would reveal. 
Luca, in those musings, did you, perchance, chat with the palace's cannons? They're original, aren't they? Indeed, they are. These cannons have been silently guarding the Principality for centuries, and while the ones mounted there may not have seen much action, they serve as vigilant reminders of the palace's intended purpose, as a fortress meant to protect. Protection is an excellent segue into our next landmark, Fort Carré in Antibes. This 16th century star-shaped fortress, gazing stoically out to sea, has stories siege-worn into its very fabric. Not to mention those stunning panoramic views. From the top, you really understand the strategic importance of this fortress. It's like a chess game, with the sea as the board and the ships as the pieces. Antibes itself, encased by ancient ramparts, is a fascinating blend of the old and the elegant. It's the sort of place where you can meander through history in the morning and then rub shoulders with contemporary celebrities at a seaside cafe in the afternoon. The Riviera is a jigsaw puzzle of history. Each piece tells a story of a different epoch. Take the Roman ruins in Frejus, for example, or the ancient amphitheater in Simies, where gladiators once clashed in fierce battles to entertain throngs of spectators. It's surreal, standing in those ancient ruins, knowing you're at the intersection of yesterday and today. The past seems almost tangible, like if you reached out, you could brush your fingers against the textures of time. Poetically spoken, Lara. But let's not sail past Villa Carolos in Bolio sur Mer, a tribute to Greek civilization nestled on the Riviera's shoreline. This replica of an ancient Grecian dwelling peers over the Mediterranean just as its predecessors would have looked onto the Aegean. Oh, Villa Carolos is an immersion into a time when philosophers roamed the colonnades and, and every decision was a dialogue with the gods. It's a breathtaking glimpse into the luxury and wisdom of the ancient world, reimagined in the Belle Epoque's heart. Glimpses into different worlds, that's what the Riviera offers in abundance. Though, my favorite historical experience is still the Roman city of Semenelum in the Simies district of Nice. The baths, the arena, life flourished here while Rome ruled, and the ruins make history come alive beneath your feet. Life still flourishes there too, in the parks and gardens that now cradle the remnants of a once thriving city. Residents play petanque where citizens of Rome might have cheered their charioteers. It's a beautiful continuity, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. There's peace there too, and the constant whisper of the past's echo. The Riviera, though, isn't all ancient history. In Cannes, for example, you'll find La Malmaison, an art center housed in what was once the Grand Hotel's games and tea room. La Malmaison keeps the spirit of the Belle Epoque alive. While we're strolling the Promenade de la Croisette in Cannes, let's not overlook the Carlton Hotel, an architectural masterpiece and the epitome of the abundance that marked the early 20th century. The Carlton's dome and turrets are of another era, a tribute to a time when opulence was the name of the game. That grandeur carries into the modern day, as the Carlton still welcomes the glitterati, especially during the famed Cannes Film Festival. From epochs past to present prestige, the Riviera's historic landmarks and architecture narrate a compelling and visually stunning tale. A tale that is still being written as we evolve and add our own lines to its leagues of history. As we close this chapter on our podcast, stay with us to embark on to Practical Travel Tips, our next segment, which will ensure you navigate the Riviera, not just as tourists, but as informed travelers, with a heart set on discovery. Pack your bags lightly, or simply let your imaginations run wild, as we return shortly with insights that will, will navigate you through the sure-footed and lesser-known paths of the Côte d'Azur. Keep listening. We'll be right back. And we're back. You're listening to Travel with Lara and Luca, where we take you beyond the tourist brochures and dive deep into the heart of destinations. Now, my friends, we bid adieu to tales of antiquity and saunter into the here and now. Lara, I think it's time to arm our listeners with some solid gold travel tips for navigating the French Riviera. What's first on the list? Solid gold indeed, Luca. First off, let's discuss getting around. The French Riviera, despite its grandeur, is incredibly accessible. One of my favorite ways to explore the coast is by train. The TER, or Regional Express Train, 
offers spectacular seaside views that you just can't get from a car window. True, the train is both a scenic and sensible choice. Tracks carved along cliff sides, tunneling through mountains and skirting the shoreline. But for those seeking a dash of old world glamour, why not rent a vintage convertible? Nothing screams Riviera like cruising with the top down, the wind in your hair, and the envy of every pedestrian. Just keep in mind, folks, those winding cliff roads are not for the faint-hearted, or for that matter, the inexperienced driver. Remember the time, Luca, when I had to take the wheel because your Italian dramatic fear of heights kicked in? How could I forget, Lara? Let's file that under quaint regional idiosyncrasies. Now, when in towns, make like the locals and take to the streets on foot, especially in places like Old Town Nice or Antibes, where every corner turned is a new delight for the senses. And while there are places that cater to tourists almost exclusively, we recommend finding those spots where locals dine and shop. A good rule of thumb is if the menu is in seven languages, consider wandering a few more blocks for a more authentic find. Spot on. Now, when it comes to dining, our insider tip is to look for restaurants that offer a menu du jour. These are daily specials using seasonal ingredients, typically a better value and a truer representation of regional cuisine than any a la carte offering. Seeking authenticity is key. Same goes for markets, the flower market in Nice, for instance. Go early, meet the locals, buy a few fresh Niswa specialties, and picnic on the beach for a different, more personal experience of the Riviera's flavors. Oh, that's a must. And while you're at it, make sure to check event schedules. There's always something happening in the Riviera, from Cannes Film Festival to Monaco Grand Prix, and events like these can affect accommodations and availability. True, if you're not keen on the buzz of big events, timing your visit to avoid these periods is wise. Though if you do find yourself in the midst of festival fever, let it carry you away. Sometimes the unplanned experiences yield the richest memories. Absolutely. Speaking of timing, although the Riviera is a year-round destination, each season offers its own charms. Summers are vibrant, bustling, and let's be frank, sometimes sweltering. Off-season months like October or April provide milder weather and fewer crowds, but with all the sights and tastes still on offer. Packing for the Riviera also requires a touch of forethought. Sunblock for those fierce Mediterranean sun rays, a good pair of walking shoes. Remember the cobblestones in Eze, Luca? How could I forget? Those cobblestones are merciless. And remember to pack a light jacket. Evenings can be cool, and some establishments eschew their casual daytime demeanor for a more upscale evening ambiance. Just as the Mediterranean dazzles, so too can the nocturnal dress code. That being said, always leave room in your luggage for a bit of shopping. From local markets to luxury boutiques, the Riviera is as much a destination for fashionistas as it is for sun seekers and history buffs. And speaking of packing, don't forget your sense of adventure. Renting a kayak to explore the coastline, discovering lesser-known diving spots off the Cap d'Antibes, or spending a day hiking the trails around St. Jean Cap Ferrat can reveal a side of the Riviera unseen by many. There's just so much to the Riviera that even we couldn't cover it all in one podcast, could we, Luca? So friends, talk to locals, ask about their favorite places, be curious, and you'll uncover gems even we might not know about. All this talk of travel tips has me itching to share the wealth of side excursions and day trips that lie a bit off the Riviera's beaten path. So don't you go wandering off because after a brief musical intermezzo, we'll whisk you off to explore those bonus experiences that add the final flourish to a Riviera retreat. Keep your wanderlust stoked, your mind curious, and join us as Travel with Lara and Luca continues. We'll be sharing our personal side trip secrets next. And here we are, dear Globetrotters, at the final bend in our Riviera journey, a detour into the day trips and side excursions that can turn your French escapade from memorable to unforgettable. Lara, share with us, where should our listeners point their compasses for these escapades? Gladly, Luca. One excursion you cannot miss is a trip to the Larins Islands. Just a short boat ride from Cannes, these islands are an oasis of tranquility. The Ile Sainte-Marguerite, 
with its historic fort and the cell of the mysterious man in the iron mask, offers a juxtaposition of nature and history that's hard to top. And don't forget Il Saint Honora, a slice of serenity where monks have been producing wine for over a millennium. The chanting monks, the vineyards, the old monastic buildings, it's spiritually and visually invigorating. Meanwhile, back on the mainland, the Corniche door offers a road trip with views that will make you believe in a higher power, even if that higher power is just gravity-defying road engineering. The cliffs, the Corsair perches, the Estorel Mountains, every turn is a painting come to life. The Estorel Mountains are a particular favorite of mine, perfect for those who wish to trade the sailing shoes for hiking boots. The ruddy rocks against the deep blue sea, it's a contrast that stirs the soul. If your soul yearns for a flutter of international flair, consider a day trip to the Italian market at Ventimiglia. Cross the border and you're in a bustling bazaar of Italian delicacies, vibrant textiles, and the leather markets. Oh, the handbags, Luca. If only our podcasting paid in Italian leather. One day, Lara, one day. On that note, let's not overlook San Remo, Italy's own version of the Riviera, but with an added dash of La Dolce Vita. It's the perfect backdrop for sipping espresso and nibbling on a cannoli while watching the Italian world amble by. The Riviera's charm extends further inland too. Consider a trip to the perched villages of Gordon for panoramic views or the art-filled St. Paul de Vence where you walk through cobblestone streets lined with galleries. Those villages are like windows to the past, with each stone telling a story. You feel a sense of timelessness as you peer down at valleys and see the same landscapes that artists and writers saw centuries ago. There's an undeniable pull to these places, like they're etched in some collective memory and beckoning us back. They're places where modern day quaintness is an everyday reality. Speaking of quaintness, if you're near grass, why not let your nose lead you to the neighboring town of Muan Sartu for a more authentic, less touristy experience? Their quaint squares and unpretentious eateries serve up a slice of local life with every meal. Now, for something quite different, a jaunt into the great outdoors, the Mercantour National Park. It's an alpine adventure full of mountain lakes, wildflowers, and perhaps even a golden eagle soaring above. The park is also home to the Valle des Merveilles, a treasure trove of Bronze Age rock carvings. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site that tugs at the imagination with its otherworldly landscapes and ancient art. It's one of the richest open-air Bronze Age art sites in Europe. Can you imagine walking in the footsteps of prehistoric artists, trying to decipher their messages etched in stone? It's like stepping into a prehistoric gallery, where the admission fee is just the effort it takes to hike there. Now that we've whetted your appetite for exploration, our listeners who are keen skiers should note that come winter, the Riviera is just a short drive away from some excellent ski resorts. Indeed, Isola 2000 or Auron offer those who want to juxtapose their beach holiday with alpine slopes the perfect opportunity. You could literally be sunbathing in Nice in the morning and skiing the Southern Alps by the afternoon. The classic Côte d'Azur contrast, beachside lounging and snow-dusted slopes, each within reach of the other. Your side excursion options are as vast as the Mediterranean Sea itself. So, when you're planning your trip, remember that the dazzle of the Riviera isn't confined to its coastal pearls. There's an entire treasure chest waiting just beyond. Every detour is an opportunity, each path a fresh brushstroke on your personal canvas of experiences. You might come for the glitz and the sun, but it's these hidden jewels that often hold the stories you'll tell for years to come. From tranquil islands to bustling markets, ancient rock carvings to snow-tipped peaks, the French Riviera's surroundings challenge the very notion of borders. Here, the past and the present, the natural and the cultivated, the French and the Italian, all exist in a harmonious blend. They say life is about the journey, not just the destination. On the Riviera, each journey transforms the traveler. So take these tips, go forth, and add your own tales to the rich tapestry woven by centuries of wanderers. Indeed, Lara. And as we conclude this segment on side excursions and day trips, remember that every great trip is a series of small adventures. Lara and I will be right here when you return, ready to whisk you away to another enchanting corner of our world. We'll be back in a moment with our final thoughts and a fond farewell. 
Stay tuned for our conclusion of this vivid journey through the French Riviera. As our Riviera ramblings come to a close, it's time to cast one last lingering look over the sun-drenched coastline that we've been meandering along for the past while. Luca, I feel a bit like I do at the end of a perfect day on the beach. I don't want it to end. I know the feeling well, Lara. There's a certain magic in the air here that's hard to leave behind. But as with any journey, it's not truly over. The Côte d'Azur, with its kaleidoscope of colors, scents, sounds, and flavors, stays with you, an enduring souvenir etched in memory. From the glitzy promenades and hidden alleys to the medieval hilltop villages, we've reveled in the glamour and basked in the quaint. We've savored the art, the history, and the tales that make this place a traveler's enigma. Through every story, every cultural tidbit, and every pro tip, we've stitched together a picture that, though grand, merely outlines the edges of the French Riviera's splendor. A splendor that's best understood not through words alone, but through the senses, sight, taste, touch, smell, and perhaps most profoundly, through emotion. This coastal paradise ensconced between alpine peaks and the Mediterranean Sea bridges past and present, evoking a persistent state of awe. Each town along the Riviera, Nice, Cannes, Monaco, Menton, and beyond, boots up an open invitation for you to craft your own narrative. And whether that narrative unfolds on a luxury yacht or a bistro's folding chair, the Riviera doesn't discriminate. It's a region generous with its charm, offering up poetry in its panoramas and wisdom in its worn streets. We've danced around the Belle Epoque, flirted with the world of art, and delved into culinary escapades that span the sumptuous spectrum of this region's palette. We've touched on tips, travel, taste, time and again, ensuring that your footprints on the Riviera Sands start off on the right note. And if our voice has been the sea breeze guiding your way, your curiosity is the ship that sails toward a horizon of discovery. So to you, our wonderful listeners, we issue a challenge. Throw away the anchor of expectation and embrace the currents of adventure. Because if there is one thing the French Riviera teaches us, it's that life, much like travel, should never be confined to a single route. It should be an anthology of experiences, a collection of moments etched in sunlight and soaked in the Mediterranean's embrace. That it should, Lara. And while today's podcast may have reached its denouement, the story of your wanderlust, we hope, is just beginning a new chapter. May your travels be as vibrant as a Matisse and as rich in spirit as a glass of Provençal Rosé. And should your paths eventually lead you to the Riviera or wherever your heartstrings pull you, remember that each journey enriches, each encounter enlightens, and every step taken in wander is a step toward the discovery of not just the world, but also oneself. As we sign off, we do so with the reminder that travels with Lara and Luca continue, not just through the airwaves, but within each of you. Until we meet again, be it on a cobblestone path, a vineyard-scented hillside, or a beach kissed by the sun, keep exploring, keep dreaming, and above all, keep traveling. Au revoir, dear listeners. Stay whimsical, stay wondrous, and stay tuned for more adventures on Travel with Lara and Luca. Luca.